Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Dr. Lin, for the uh, introduction. My name is Yuqing. I'm a cardiologist from the National University Heart Center of Singapore, and I'll be speaking on the science of cardiac amyloidosis, the pathophysiology, and the red flag. So cardiac amyloidosis, once thought to be a rare disease, has been increasingly diagnosed due to increased awareness and new imaging modalities. So what exactly is amyloidosis? This is actually a disease of abnormal protein misfolding and deposition. In our body, there are many different types of proteins performing different functions. In amyloidosis, there's misfolding of the protein from its normal physiological structure, and um, into a more linear shape, also known as the beta plated sheets. And instead of being soluble, the misfolded protein then accumulates to form the insoluble uh, fibrils, which then deposit in the extracellular spaces, distorting the tissue architecture and leading to organ dysfunction. There are many different types of proteins that can cause amyloidosis, but fortunately for us, there's only two main types that affect the heart. So 95% of all cardiac amyloidosis is either due to light chain amyloidosis, also known as EL, or the transthyretin amyloidosis, also known as ATTR. So a little bit on the nomenclature, the A in front of AL and ATTR uh, represents amyloidosis. L stands for light chain, while TTR is a short form for transthyretin. And we can further subclassify the transthyretin amyloidosis into two groups, depending on whether the genetic mutation is present in the TTR gene. If there is a genetic mutation, then uh, the patient has hereditary or familial um, transthyretin amyloidosis. And if they do not have the genetic mutation, they are, also, they are then diagnosed with the wild type, also previously known as the senile type. So light chain amyloidosis is actually a plasma cell disorder where the bone marrow produces excessive amount of plasma cells, which in turn leads to overproduction of immunoglobulin. We all need immunoglobulins and they are usually produced to fight infections. So each of these immunoglobulin, they do have um, heavy chain and light chains. So in light chain amyloidosis, uh, there is excessive amount of immunoglobulin, which leads to excessive amount of light chains, which tends misfold and, and comes together forming the insoluble amyloid fibril. So this is mainly a systemic disease that not only affects the heart, but also several other organs, especially the kidneys, the gastrointestinal tract, and the nervous system. Transteretin or TTR is a different type of protein altogether. So this is a protein that is um, present in all of us, but um, and it consists of four identical amino acid monomers that are bound together, forming a, a tetramer. So the TTR tetramer um, in our body functions as a transport protein and it carries the hormone tyroxine as well as the retinal binding protein which in turn carry vitamin A throughout the body. So this is actually produced in the liver and it should circulate intact as a tetramer in the bloodstream. So in patients with amyloidosis, the TTR tetramer breaks apart into monomers which then misfold and eventually forms the amorphous oligomers and therefore the amyloid fibrils. In patients with hereditary ATTR, this is due to genetic mutation, which makes the TTR um, tetrama unstable. In patients with the wild type TTR, um, the tetrama becomes unstable, possibly due to aging process or some other factors which are not well defined yet. So despite previously known as the sonar type, they can also be seen in patients less than 50 years old. In cardiac amyloidosis, um, regardless of whether it's due to AL or ATTR, the amyloid fibrils then deposit in the extracellular spaces surrounding the myocytes, causing thickening of the myocardium. The circulating oligomers and misfolded light chains are cytotoxic and they can also lead to direct cell death and apoptosis. In AL, the pattern of amyloid deposition is usually subendocardial and diffuse, whilst in ATTR, there can be patchy areas of transmural involvement, and the subset can actually lead to asymmetric septal hypertrophy, which can mix hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. <clears throat> so um, in cardiac amyloidosis, the, the deposition of the amyloid fibrils then distort the normal cardiac architecture, leading to symptoms. So deposition of the amyloid fibrils in the myocardium leads to thickening of the ventricular wall and septum, causing the left and right heart to be stiff and thick, and hence leading to heart failure symptoms. This is a still image of, 
of a four chamber view on an echocardiogram of a patient with cardiac amyloidosis. And we can see that the interventricular septum is very thick and hyperechoic, which basically means that it appears very bright and sparkly on the echocardiogram. So we can also see that the valves are thickened, and this usually leads to a certain degree of valve regurgitation. The atrial is almost always involved in cardiac amyloidosis, and we can see from this two image again that uh, interatrial septums appear thickened and hyperechoic as well. This eventually leads to poor atrial function and can predispose to atrial fibrillation, which can sometimes occur years before the onset of heart failure symptoms. The conduction system can also be affected, leading to varying degrees of heart blocks and bundle branch blocks. In fact, some patients may require pacemaker implantation. In patients with cardiac amyloidosis, some of them can actually present with angina due to the deposition of the amyloid fibrils in the, in the intramural um, epicardial arteries. So more often than not, the coronary angiogram will often reveal non-obstructive epicardial coronary arteries. So aside from the heart, the amyloid fibrils can also be deposited elsewhere in the body. Ocular involvement can occur. The, um, the amyloid fibrils can be deposited in any part of the eyes, causing proptosis, diplopia, and eyes, eye and eye irritation. Deposition of the amyloid fibrils in the wrist can cause compression of the median nerve, leading to carpal tunnel syndrome, and this is often bilateral. Deposition into the ligamentum flavum leads to spinal stenosis. And involvement of the nervous system can cause sensory motor neuropathy as well as autonomic dysfunction. <clears throat> involvement of the kidneys lead to nephrotic range proteinuria, and involvement of the gastrointestinal tract can lead to constipation, diarrhea, mixture of both, and weight loss. So, as with any diagnosis, we know that delayed diagnosis leads to delayed treatment and hence poor prognosis. We used to think that cardiac amyloidosis is a rare disease. However, um, transthyretic amyloidosis, especially the wild type in this aging population, is not as uncommon as what we thought it was. And it's often an unrecognized cause of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, especially in the elderly. In an autopsy study done um, years ago, it was found that up to 25% of patients above the age of 85 years old had amyloid deposition in the body. Another more recent study showed that 13% of patients admitted for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and above the age of 60 year old was diagnosed to have cardiac amyloidosis based on the technician phyrophosphate scans. An even more recent study shows that 16% of patients aged above 65 year old who underwent transcatheter aortic valve replacement for severe aortic stenosis was found to have transteratin amyloidosis. So these patients often present with heart failure and um, they do have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. However, in advanced cases, the systol systolic dysfunction can occur. So we look at the, the electrocardiogram. Um, um, text, classical textbook um, description would be the low voltage on ECG. However, we have to be a little bit careful on this because there's only 30 to 50% of patients with cardiac amyloidosis will have low voltage ECG. In fact, one third of them will have left bundle branch block or left ventricular hypertrophy or voltage criteria on ECG. Most of these patients will have a pseudo-infarct pattern on the ECG, which means that we do see Q waves on the ECG, but coronary angiogram did not reveal any significant coronary artery disease. Next, we look at the transthoracic echocardiogram. So, and if there is unexplained increased wall thickness on the transthoracic echocardiogram of more than 12 millimeter, especially if they do not have a previous history of hypertension, and if this patient presents with heart failure, and, and if we look at the ECG, um, that there is low voltage on the ECG, the suspicion for cardiac amyloidosis has to be very high. Other things that we look out on the transthoracic echocardiogram are the right ventricular hypertrophy, thickened interatrial septum, thickened valve, and small pericardial effusion. So the other reflex are um, reduced longitudinal strain imaging with apical sparing on the echocardiogram, typically described as the cherry on top. Um, some patients with aortic stenosis, especially the elderly patients it, who has low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis, or patients with a new diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in an elderly patient, 
or patients with new low or normal blood pressure, especially if they do have a history of hypertension in the past, and we find that we will have to decrease the dosage of antihypertensives or even stop it. These are some of the clues that, that we have to pick up on. Most of the patients with cardiac amyloidosis are unable to tolerate heart failure medications and medications such as beta blocker, ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blockers actually make them feel worse. So the other red flags that we look out for are the previous history of couple tunnel syndrome, especially if they do have bilateral couple tunnel syndrome in the past, history of spinal stenosis, bicep tendon rupture, and some of this can actually occur many, many years before the onset of heart failure. A lot of our patients with, uh, with amyloidosis also have peripheral neuropathy, autonomic neuropathy, orthostatic hypotension. Family history is important, especially if there's a family member already diagnosed with amyloidosis. Nephrotic syndrome, microglossia, microglossia and or periorbital purpura more common in with the light chain amyloidosis. Okay, so I'd like to spend a few minutes on the diagnosis and workup of um, cardiac amyloidosis. So once a patient um, is diagnosed to have cardiac amyloidosis, the first thing to do is to exclude, um, to, to actually classify whether this is uh, light chain amyloidosis or transdurated amyloidosis. So we check for serum-free light chain, serum and urine electrophoresis with immunofixation, and any of this abnormal, we will refer them to the hematologist for consideration of bone marrow biopsy. If this um, investigation has come back normal, then we will proceed with endomyocardial biopsy or the technician pyrophosphate scan. And once the diagnosis of cardiac amyloidosis of transdirecting cardiac amyloidosis is confirmed, the patients will be sent for genetic um, counseling and genetic testing. And if they are found to have the mutation in the TTR genes, these patients have hereditary trans, uh, transdirectin amyloidosis. And of course, they will have impact on the family members. If they do not carry their normal gene, they are then classified as the wild type. Okay, with this, I thank you.